Via telephone, financial Phil, Phil McCoy from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad's Group of Financial Advisors on Winchester Avenue in Martinsburg. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, guys. How are you all? Marvelous, Phil. Marvelous. <laughs> Phil, do you, do you have a, uh, a disaster story at all that could uh, compete with what Gilstrap just told us? No, not no, not that I can think of. I'm sure I've had a few, but right now that I can think of, I do not have any. Closest I can come to that, and it is nowhere near as close as what he went through, was when I was in college, I had a job in the summers working on uh, sunken swimming pools. And one of the things that we would do before we would open them up in the, in the early summer is, or late spring, is you would acid, acid wash them. And these are big community pools, okay? So uh, you, in those days, you drain the water, pumped it all out, then you scrub down the pool, repainted it if you need to or whatever, retiled, and then you, you know, fill the pool back up with water so in the draining process you know you've been there scrubbing with the brush and muriatic acid and whatever and and it was legendary that at some point along the way you're going to slip on the pool and go right down into the bottom into the drink into the into the deep end where all the funk was all the leaves dead animals and the acid was all draining into there <laughs> right and i'd never it had never happened to me until one day when it did and you were talking about john how the floor gave way and it happened so fast I was standing on the in, in, kind of like in the, in the way down to the deep end where the the wall kind of curves down to meet the floor, you know, mm -hmm. and it's it's it was wet. So it was slick. And I took a step and that I don't remember anything after I took the step because I went head. I went down head first into the cement uh, wall like that. And then right down into the drink, <laughs> right down into the funk with the acid. And all, oh, that was just a lot, of, a lot of fun, and I got a good headache from it, too. That, but that's the, the closest that I could even compete with that story. And then you got to climb out of the slippery place without going back in over right, and well, over again. It's, yeah. it's like trying to hit your way out of the sand trap with the wedge, right? <laughs> it's a tough lie there. Uh, Phil, well, how was volleyball Phil's weekend? It was a long weekend, uh, but uh, we got through it. We survived and are ready for work today. Now, for those who but don't know, weekend. you're also a, uh, a volleyball coach. A uh, travel volleyball coach. So it's just a, it's a few days a week and then every, uh, well, just about every weekend from January through the end of April. So we're coming up on the end of our season, but it's, it's been a good one. It's been fun. And you know it's not Ada's team. I can't. She. I'm. I'm not allowed to, to coach my daughter. Nor would I ever want to. But um, it was. We were in separate places this weekend, and most of the time we're in the same place. But uh, so I still get to watch her play some. But this weekend we were in different places. She had more success than uh, her coach father did this weekend. But, uh, <laughs> but it's still been a good season. How does a uh, former football guy become a volleyball dad? <laughs> two daughters but it was <laughs> the um you know i got i used to after after i finished playing football i i was i was broken and completely broken and and wasn't able to you know cont continue any contact sports so i did get into volleyball uh fresh out of college just rec league and two 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 man teams and so forth had a lot of fun and eventually got drawn into it when my oldest uh, started playing rec league when she was eight, and so I got drawn into rec league, which led me into travel, and that was uh, now Abigail is finished, and she's my assistant coach, which has been one of the funnest things I've ever done. She's much much smarter than I am when it comes to volleyball, but um, so since she's been eight years old, I've been involved in in coaching, and that came, kind of came from John too. If you if you remember, John used to be the head coach for Martinsburg. Yes, John Everson, so when I first your partner. Started, yeah, we had uh, we had some things in common when I first started um, working with John, and, and so. But I've kept it up, and and I, I may retire soon because you know, I'd like to see Ada play more during the travel season. And as her age group gets older, they go into different places, and I'm not. I'm no way am I going to coach her. So. I think I, I may be retiring my volleyball hat after this season if, if the schedule won't allow us to be at the same place. Are, are the travel leagues or travel um, uh, associated with either the rec league or high school play, either one? No. The, uh, and they, these are, you know, this is, they start at a 12U, which means you're 12 years or younger, and it goes up every age group from there. And the particular club that we're at is in Virginia, just right across the uh, – 
the line, but there's strict rules, especially for West Virginia kids, not so much for Maryland and Virginia. And that's where all of our kids come from, West Virginia, Maryland, and Virginia. But there's very strict rules for West Virginia kids. They are not to be participating in any travel or club volleyball while the varsity season is going on. So that's, uh, it's always been a joke because the, they start the Sunday after the state tournament. They don't even, they take a day off, if that, and they're right into travel season while the other states, they allow their kids to go play travel and, and, and communicate, I guess, with the travel teams while they're still playing varsity, but not, not in West Virginia. And I don't know that that really matters for our local coaches because I don't think they would be permissive of these kids going to play travel volleyball in the middle of varsity season anyway but uh so they're, they're not they're not connected at all hey phil what's the venue for these games is are they like sand pits are they indoor outdoor no 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 that's that's a different sport and I'm glad you because they have they do have a sand league in or a beach they would call it it's one of the biggest ones on the east coast and it's at clearbrook park and that season will start here shortly actually and um that that's a different sport and although it's beach volleyball but the indoor travel they're they're held at mostly convention centers where you'll go and there's you know we've been at tournaments where there's 400 plus teams there and you know of different age groups of course and it is just a huge packed facility and it's loud it, it takes all day long it's fun but uh, but they're normally at convention centers, typically in bigger cities, D.C., Philadelphia, uh, some in Virginia Beach and Roanoke and, and et cetera. And in and, and places where they don't have convention centers, they'll be held at multiple locations where you may have 15 teams are playing here, and which is why we were separated this week, and four, six teams are playing somewhere else and seven teams are, are somewhere else as well. And so they'll have to split them up. It's the same tournament, just in different locations. And these uh, these tournaments, whether it's volleyball or soccer, softball, whatever, uh, these are great tourism attractions for towns and communities that build these multi-field complexes, or in Phil's case, they're using gymnasiums and field houses and whatever, because you can bring in so many teams. And if it's over the weekend, that means they all have to stay and eat and get a place to sleep, too. And these, yeah. these are great uh, tourism attractions for places. And Disney yeah, is and one of the main of benefactors are, of this. In AAU tournament, yes. In, but there are, uh, a lot of them are referred to as stay and play, which mm-hmm. means you have to stay there in order to play in the tournament. And when you look at, you know, Capital Classic comes to mind. And, you know, for the 15U division, all different levels. You say, hey, we want to play in the open division or we want to play in the mid-level division or the third division. They've always got different divisions. But you may have three or 400 teams at some of these tournaments from different countries. You know, we had some from Canada and I mean they're they're all from all over the place. Texas, California, they're they're from everywhere. So it's it's cool. You know, you get to meet a lot of different people and see a, a lot of different skill levels. So it it's good. It's it's a lot, but it's good. Hey Phil, where do you get the money for the travel elite? That's why I coach. <laughs> <laughs> Par- parents you know, pay to belong. Parents pay. That I yeah. Parents yeah. pay to belong. But the parents pay for it. Yep. Yeah, and they have a you know they have a tuition, if you will, that they that they pay at the beginning of the season, and there's payment plans, and but it does it gets to be a financial burden on on a lot of them, I'm sure, because not only do you have to pay, you know, to to just to play, but you also you know assuming you're going to go watch your child play, you have to spend the nights, you know, and in some most cases there's three nights in a hotel in another city and. So it's a lot of stress and a lot of commitment from the kids and the parents, but uh, but that that's where that's where it comes from. It comes from the pockets of mothers and fathers. Let's talk money, Phil. Market futures are up uh, strongly this morning too. The Dow, the S and P, uh, both up about two thirds of a percent. Nasdaq futures are up about a third of a percent. We closed the week fairly well last week too. What's the story? Uh, well, last week we had you know of course the Federal Reserve and. And we had a lot of volatility, but we did finish up. I would like to focus, as we finish out this first quarter of 2023, I'd like to shine a light on the fourth quarter of 2022 and put that in connection with the first quarter of 2023, where we're going on two consecutive quarters of positive market performance, albeit very volatile. 
and we've kind of been bouncing between 3,800 and 42 on the S&P, but we are still looking at two consecutive positive quarters. And a lot of people think, and I don't know that I fall in this category or not, so I'm just regurgitating others' opinions, but a lot of people think that this, this bank failure, this bank weakness that we have seen, if it's contained, and if, if it is contained in the United States, if it's contained, then that may do the Federal, Federal Reserve's job for it. And that's the reason why we only had a quarter of a percent rate increase last week instead of half a percent rate increase. And the next time it may be a pause, and therefore our markets reacted, albeit slightly, reacted positively off of that news. Now we're going to go back to what we've been paying attention to for quite some time. Really, I'm getting, I wish it would, we could have another narrative, but it is the pace of inflation and how the Federal Reserve reacts to that in their in their fight to get down to that target rate of two percent. And our stance has been all along that they're they're going to win that battle, and they're they're going to get inflation down to their target, whether it's two or two and a half percent. Some people suggest that maybe they need to change their target, but they're going to get it there. And the the only question is how long will it take? And that's what some of this information jobless claims and employment numbers, CPI, PPI, PCE, all these things we've been talking about, those are indicators of how long that may take. And eventually, you know, there's a debate whether or not, or, or I guess differing opinions, whether or not we'll go into a recession and, you know, we get GDP numbers here shortly as well, but whether or not we're going to go into a recession, and if so, how long will that recession last? And we maintain, you know, as far as the markets are concerned, while it may be like a, a shock initially, if our markets may be shocked initially, if we were to see signs that we're going into a recession, but the signal of a recession is a signal that our, our economy is at its trough. And if you think back to your high school or college days when you're studying economics, if you're in a trough in your economy, what's the next thing that's going to happen, which is expansion? And our markets are always looking forward. So there's a lot of interesting numbers of how our markets react to a recession. And, you know, once it's first announced and how, uh, how it reacts and then but over the breadth of the recession from announcement to the end of it, it, it it's quite positive, actually, from the announcement, not from the beginning of the recession. So there, there's a lot of things to take into consideration and a lot of different opinions. But in the long run, which is really all that we care about, in the long run, we, we do believe that the Federal Reserve will win that battle no matter what they have to do and how much pain it takes to get there. And pain being a word that Jerome Powell used in August of 2022 that sent us spiraling down to our, our, almost our new lows on in September. But pain being the key word and what he mean by pain, and, and I think what he really meant by that to underlying is the employment uh, market and what it looks like if it, if it has to cause pain, then it will. But if we get there and they pause with the rate and, and then eventually reverse and start to cut rates again, that's when our markets will soar or, or will continue to do well, I should say. But we are looking at two consecutive quarters without something drastic happening here in the last couple of days, which I would never rule out. But without something happening in the next few days, we're looking at two consecutive positive quarters for our market. Bill? Yeah, uh, Phil, you've presented a lot of information. Uh, you did mention earlier, though, about containing the U.S. bank failures. Uh, why was, was there so much attention given to the possibility of a German bank failing over the weekend? I realize we have an international market, but you you featured the, local, the uh, U.S. banks, but yet a lot of attention given to the German bank. It's, it's a, a lot of fear, no different than if you hear another country. And, and think back to the, to the COVID days when we would get news that, hey, this country has had a, quite a bit of spread or their COVID spread has been reduced, and we would say, hey, that's going to be us eventually. And that's sort of the same thing with the German banks or any foreign banks that we may have. We've got this fear of our bank system failing, and that's, that's what contributes to some of that fear is banks foreign-wide. So as a consumer – when you hear Credit Suisse or when you hear Deutsche Bank, and they don't know that that resonates that that's not a bank in the United States because we do invest in some of the you – know, we have clients that's invested in some of their structured notes and their structured CDs, but the underlier of those notes and CDs, et cetera, 
our, our market performance, so it's not really tied to the success or the failure of the name that's on the bank. It's just the bank that sponsored that. So it does create some fear when it's overseas, but from the Federal Reserve standpoint, their bigger focus really is on our banks here at home and can we contain the, the few banks that had some failures, SVB being the, the, the one that comes to mind, of course, first. Can we contain that? And then what is the ability, because I also had this question posed to me actually this morning at the gym, is why would our markets bounce just because another bank took over SVB Bank, or why would why do we see that as a positive sign? And the only reason that, that what that says to us is these other banks think that it is contained, that it, this is an anomaly, and they just weren't doing business the right way, and it's not a sign of the overall financial market. It's more of a sign of these banks, this handful of banks that wasn't doing things the right way, and they didn't prepare properly for the increase in interest rates that we've seen from the Federal Reserve. If I read the news correctly, and I, I uh, very quickly over my head when it comes to financial things, but uh, apparently Janet Yellen said something to the effect that the Federal Reserve is going to cover all deposits. The, the $250,000 max is essentially suspended. Did I hear that right? No, she said she did. They did do that for SVB to contain fear for them. But it was, and I, I kind of walked away with the same impression as well. But then when I went back and read more into it, she, she suggested that that could be the case for regional and, and small local banks, that they would increase the FDIC and cover all of them. And then the very next day, right after Jerome Powell spoke, she said, no, 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 there's no plans to do that just yet. I gave credit to that bad day that we had. If you remember, and I don't know if you do, but we watch this stuff in the office, especially Tyler. But when they, they announced the quarter of a percent cut or increase, I'm sorry, increase in rates, our markets did really well, went up about half a percent, three quarter of a percent immediately. And then when they started talking, it started falling. And then Janet Yellen had said, and, and she's not part of the Federal Reserve, but she had said in an interview, there were no plans to, to increase of FDIC at the moment. And I think we did have quite a bounce based off of that perception that they were going to do that. I actually thought that she said that as well, and apparently she did not, or she backtracked on what she said and, and, and kind of corrected her statement. But that is not the case right now, but she suggested that it could. Now, there, there is a lot of outcry to increase that FDIC insurance. There is a ton of outcry for that. Saying, hey, this has been the case forever, and if you don't want runs on the bank, because what you're getting is – are people and entities that have more than 250000 in the bank. So you've got these large chunks of money leaving institutions simply because they have millions upon millions in it, and they're only covered for 250 So they're spreading that money out, and they're pulling it out, and that's causing a big run on the bank. So if you want to stop bank runs, then you have to increase the FDIC protection for them to stop that from happening. So there is some there is some momentum for that to happen, but she did reiterate that that's not the case right now. Yeah, uh, uh, Phil, we hear so much now about China and the Cold War we're entering with China, and we also heard over the years the investment China has made in our country. Do they have enough investment that they can manipulate some of these banks and the bank failures? Uh, probably, you know, with the money that they have inside the banks, and I, I don't know a, a direct answer to that, but they do have a lot, just like we have a lot of investments in their economy as well. So our, our economies are intertwined, and that is the one economy that, you know, we, we hear things over news and, uh, over overseas, and we tend to dismiss it and say, that's ah, just a day, it's not a big deal. But that's not really the case with China and, and, and such for us and them as well. But, yeah, I'm sure they have it, especially in local banks where they have put put stake down and bought land and business and so forth, where they could manipulate it if they pulled their money out. But at the same time, is that manipulation or is they just, are they just reacting just like everybody else? But, yeah, I would say that they probably do have enough investments where on a small or local regional bank, they could, not a big national bank. When you think of a Bank of America or a J.P. Morgan Chase, not one of those guys that are spread out all across the country but a small regional or local bank? Probably. I would assume so. Phil, about a minute left here. How do we reach you for more information today? 
You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. All right. Now, this is March 27th, so we are a month away from the NFL draft. Who are the Steelers taking, Phil? What position? Man, I don't know. I kind of hope that they still take an offensive lineman. They made a lot of moves picking up free agent offensive linemen, but I like to have some young blood in there, too. We, we need to build a, a new picket fence. Not an old man picket fence. So let's build a new fence with like we did with the likes of DeCastro and Pouncey and Foster and so forth. Let's get some young blood in there. I like what they've done, but I'd still like to see a big hog taken in the first round. I'd still like to see that. I like, I like where you're going with the, the naming rights there, Phil. you got the quarterback name Pickett as offensive line as the picket fence, which is also <laughs> a great I stole that from somewhere. It's a great scene out of Hoosiers, by the way. Billy, we're going to run yeah. the picket fence. <laughs> 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 best movie ever. It's a good one. That it's is the one. best movie ever. No way Gene Hackman gets Barbara Hershey if he's not a movie star. It's just not going to happen. That is best movie ever. Phil, good to talk with you. Thank you, guys. Have a great week. You can catch Phil McCoy weekday mornings at 638, replayed at 738 with a two-minute synopsis of the upcoming business day right here on Talk Radio WRNR and uh, TV 10.